speakers and fellow guests, we ask that you turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices, refrain from speaking audibly using flash photography or any unauthorized recording devices, and avoid entering and exiting the hall unnecessarily. If you are using an electronic device or disrupting the performance in any way, you may be asked to leave. Thank you and enjoy the performance. Good evening, everyone. Um, in my role as the Interim Provost and Academic Vice President, it is my distinct pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you this, on this momentous occasion, the 2024 Distinguished Fac Faculty Lecture. I want to express our sincere gratitude to students Matthias Luchens and Gabriel Zani for providing the prelude music this evening. The Distinguished Faculty Lecture holds a rich legacy dating back to its inception in 1969 by then President John Bernard. It was established as an annual award to honor faculty members uh, <laughs> whose contributions to research or creative endeavors, teaching, and service to the university, university exemplify the highest standards of, of our academic community. In 2022, President Gui Wong adopted the recommendation of the Faculty Senate to reconstitute this prestigious accolade as the Distinguished University Professor. Throughout its history, the recipients of this illustrious award have spanned a wide spectrum of disciplines and backgrounds, reflecting the diverse excellence that characterizes Western Illinois University and our curriculum. I would like to take a moment to recognize and applaud the past recipients who have honored us with their presence today. Uh, re past recipients, please stand. Thank you very much. This year, we have the distinct privilege of bestowing the award of Distinguished University Professor upon Dr. Richard Cangro, an outstanding professor from the School of Music within the College of Fine Arts and Communication. Now I would like to invite Dr. Jeff Brown, Director of the School of Music, to join us on the stage, join me on the stage, and share remarks on behalf of our honor honoree, Dr. Richard Cangro. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our guests joining us in COFAC Recital Hall and to everyone watching our live streamed presentation. I'm Jeff Brown, Director of the School of Music at Western Illinois University, and it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished university professor, Dr. Richard Kengro. Dr. Kengro joined our faculty in 2008 and has taught a broad range of courses in music. As you will see momentarily, he has a contagious enthusiasm for music and his teaching is informed by prolific research. His record of scholarly achievements encompasses a broad spectrum of activities as a teacher, presenter, author, performer, and conductor. He has been awarded the Fulbright Teaching Specialist Grant twice and worked with teachers and students in Pakistan and China. His record demonstrates a consistent commitment to promoting music education in international venues throughout North America, Europe, and Asia and he has contributed to WIU's efforts to increase international enrollment. He's an experienced presenter at regional, national, and international conferences on a broad range of topics, and his articles have been published in the Music Educators Journal, American Music Teacher, and many others. While these achievements alone would constitute an impressive scholarly record, it is remarkable to note that Dr. Kangaroo also maintains an active schedule as a trumpet player and conductor serving as the music director and conductor of the Quincy Area Youth Orchestra and the Monmouth Civic Orchestra in addition to frequent guest artist engagements. So now to present creativity and collaboration, ways of making and sharing music, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Kengro. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm waiting for my microphone to come on. Hey, there it is. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out this evening to come see my show. It's going to be a, a really good, uh, engaging performance, I hope. 
uh, and I could not have done it without my friends. You know, I got this uh, award, and you know, I'm, it's a little bit of imposter syndrome, you know, because I teach with many fabulous, fabulous people, and I'm honored uh, to be at the School of Music here at Western. Uh, I love Western, everyone knows that. Um, and like I said, I teach with many distinguished people, but I'm keeping the medal, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there are so many people to thank, so let's, let's get started here with this. So, you know, I could not have done this, this presentation. I, I like to uh, not only talk the talk, but walk the walk, you know? So I, I like to, if I say I'm gonna do something about collaboration, then I don't wanna just talk about it, I wanna do it. So there's so many people to thank, you know, obviously thank Western Illinois University, the people that helped me put this presentation together, Brenda McConnell in the provost's office, Phil Weiss in the booth, and Joni Herbert, our manager here. Uh, obviously my family, my teachers, and my mentors, and my friends and colleagues, many of you are here today, and my collaborators for this evening, who you will experience. This is very exciting. So the goal is for this presentation. Now, what I hope to do is to engage you in talking about creativity and collaboration and different ways that we can do that in music. And I have, you know, I have some information I want to present to you. I have some videos that, uh, that I think you're really going to love and some performances. Uh, but I want to give you some personal accounts. I want to give you some historical perspective. I want to give you some psychological elements and some social elements. And there will be audience participation. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'm excited for that too. So the easiest kind of collaboration, I'm wondering if we can get rid of the feedback, Phil? Thank you, he's working on it, he's working on it. So the easiest kind of uh, collaboration would be <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking. Uh, I'll, start taking, I'll start making up stories about you, Phil, if you want me to, like I was before, <laughs> man. Uh, so the easiest kind of collaboration here, we've got Freddie Mercury and Queen singing to the crowd and the crowd singing back call and response. So let's try some of this here. I'm going to test you. All right, so what would you do if I came up to you, and this is the participation part, if I came up to you and said, then I saw her face, what would you say? Oh, nice job. We're collaborating. Well done. What would you do? This is for the baseball fans. What would you do if I said, sweet Caroline? Good times never seem so good. So good, so good, so good. Nice job. Thank you for collaborating. And that's all my presentation. Thank you for coming this evening. <laughs> so that's it. That's how it starts. We all have this ability to collaborate and, and, and have this shared goal of, of doing something like that. So I'm going to prove that to you in just a little bit. So my story. Uh, when I, I, I taught in Connecticut for 15 years before I came to Western, and uh, I was a band and orchestra director at the junior high level. And um, at that time, I got the job in West Hartford, Connecticut. I also got accepted to the PhD program, and so I kind of uh, did both, and I, I took a really long time to do my PhD. I stretched it as long as I possibly could, right? And, uh, and so I started realizing that what I was doing as a teacher was different than what I was learning, right? And this happens a lot in education. So, uh, you know, I would stand on, on a podium or stand in front of a groups and tell them what to do. Tell, 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 right? But telling is not teaching, right? So I was taking classes in the College of Education, and I took a course that changed my life. It was called Models of Instruction, or Models of Teaching and Learning. And so there, I started learning about different ways to engage people in learning and how to help them, or how to facilitate their learning in music and in all areas. And so it really changed my life and changed my outlook on my goals, my personal goals as a teacher. I started thinking about what do I want my students to know and be able to do when they graduate. And, and if, you're, if you're one of my students or one of my former students, you've heard me say that a billion times. I'm sorry, but that's just my mantra. You know, what do I want my students to know and be able to do when they graduate? And I want them to be musicians. I want them to graduate, and all the stuff that we do in our program, I want them to be able to do by themselves. Well, then that infers that they need to experience some, being, some independent opportunities while they're with me as a teacher, and I need to let them go, give them the tools, and let them go to be independent, make their mistakes, to struggle through things, get along together and figure it out together, and then when they graduate, they can do it without me. So that's my goal, and that's kind of how I dedicate my teaching today um, and what my students experience. So that kind of came into, uh, I, I started studying that, and I did my dissertation on the effects of cooperative learning, and I've been at it ever since. So what is collaboration? So there are many different definitions, there's many different ideas and models of collaboration, but I just pulled a few words to get us started. Uh, it's communication between two or more people. Uh, it means collegiality, right? People getting together, working together, shared experience, partnership, interdependence, 
Interdependence in this case means we either sink or swim together as a group. Uh, and the act of producing something new together. So let's try some of the stuff I'm blabbing about here. So uh, we all have this innate ability to cooperate, and I'm going to show that to you. So when I give you the signal, I'd like you to start applauding. And as you applaud, I want you to start to listen to the people around you and start to applaud in synchrony so that we are all applauding at the same rhythm, right? So just to show you. Now, I could do this very easy and say, okay, this is what I want you to applaud, but that kind of defeats the purpose or the goal. The goal is for you to realize that you can come together with this shared goal of clapping together, and I'm just going to let you do it. So I'm going to time it. Hopefully it doesn't take up my whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things I was telling my friends. I was like, this is the roll of the dice part of the presentation. I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, but I'm going to time you, and let's start the applause. And go. <laughs> Listen to each other. OK, 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 OK. That took six seconds. I was supposed to take longer. I don't know what I'm going to say now. But you see, you all have, that's amazing. We should, that's a, like a world record or something. I don't know what. I think there are some musicians in the audience. Uh, but yes, you all have that ability to come together. Like I said, I could have just conducted that. I do a lot of conducting, but you did it yourselves. So congratulations. You can all, you can all clap together. Six seconds. <laughs> that was our shared goal. But let's come back to this here. Cooperation is the foundation of human development in that we learn how to be together before we learn how to stand apart. I really love that quote. I think that's very profound and especially uh, meaningful today, right? So collaboration in the arts. I'll read some of these quotes to you. Uh, so even those who work seemingly in isolation build on the work of those who have gone before them. Artistic innovations are not made by isolated geniuses, but are usually based on the lessons of teachers and the collaboration of colleagues. Makes sense? Recognition of the ways in which creativity emerges from joint effort has given rise to the investigation of creative collaborations and partnerships and the notion of group creativity. So this is from um, uh, oop, an article by Gallinson, sorry. Oh, now I did it. Sorry about that. Almost there. There it is, Gallinson, 2006. So old masters and young I keep skipping it, sorry. <laughs> so composer collaboration. So this is something that is very familiar to us as musicians. Uh, you think of some of the great composers and how they got to be great. Well, they listened to people or they studied people that came before them. This happens a lot in history, right? So composers learning from past composers, composers, learning, uh, composers and musicians collaborating, composers and visual artists, composers and choreographers. And this is a new one that I had not considered, composers and substances. Why not? This was inspired by uh, the Colorado Symphony and their fundraising concerts called Classically Cannabis. <laughs> Dr. Brown, there's a new idea for our, our ensemble program. <laughs> mm. So uh, what, what I did to prepare for this, um, for this presentation was I spoke to a number of composer friends and performer friends, and I interviewed them informally. So this is a friend of mine. Her name is Jordan Janosko, and she is, uh, she's going to talk about composing and collaborating. of talent, but someone who's able to interject ideas, um, you know, into my writing process, and, th you know, we can have this sort of back and forth collaborative energy, and with this piece, Argonauta, it ended up evolving through this sort of symbiotic relationship into something that is truly exceptional. That's, yeah, that's something I love the melding of minds, the combining of ideas that result in a product that is really greater than the sum of its parts. For me... Yeah, that's, that's the big part right there, a product that is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So uh, I wanted to provide a historical perspective on collaboration. You can think again like collaboration has been happening since the beginning of time, right? Especially in music. And so uh, I'm going to uh, give an entry point of the High Renaissance, the 1500s or so, uh, the high art of poly polychoral music in, in this place, St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, Italy. I have not been there, but I plan on going there someday. But you can see how beautiful it is, and you can see how um, just music would just 
you know, flowed up and the heightened worship and, and all of those great things. And so composers like uh, um, Adrienne Willart, who uh, he's kind of um, known for this idea of this coro spezzati or split choir, right? So it's just a technique in that uh, when he wrote choral music based on the Psalms of the Old Testament, he would have choirs kind of alternate and give a different kind of feeling instead of just one choir singing it all to you, right? So then they started experimenting with that and spacing them out even more and giving this stereo effect. And you can see the potential here in St. St. Mark's that you can have these balconies here and ensembles there. So what I thought I would do for you tonight was give you that feeling. So we're going to perform for you with the brass ensemble, the Canzone Persona di Settimi Tono a Otto. Thank you for letting me flex my Italian muscles. I haven't flexed those in a while. Uh, by Giovanni Gabrielli. Uh, and so I have two brass choirs behind you. And uh, uh, thank you to my friends. We have some faculty and colleagues that are going to perform Gabrielli's piece for you. So here we go. Oopsie. Bill, can we turn the lights up a bit? There we go. That's bad. So you can imagine, it's difficult to do, actually, in an antiphonal way that we were just doing. Uh, we rehearsed for, I think, uh, 13 and a half minutes, was that? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but there's a lot of coordination, there's a lot of collaboration. They have to really uh, be in sync with me as I'm conducting, but you've got this distance, right? The visual and the, and the acoustical difference. And in St. Mark's, I cannot imagine what that must be like, but I'm sure it sounds just amazing, right? So early childhood collaboration, let's, let's jump to that. So early childhood collaboration, I think about this. <laughs> right? If you're a parent, you know definitely what it's like to feed your toddler, all right? But spoons don't make that sound, sorry. So the earliest narratives were musical. So this is an article by uh, Ellen Desanayaki, De and she writes, the human capacities to coordinate activities with others, to cooperate and to collaborate emerge early in life. The phenomenon of communicative musicality illustrates the ways in which infants and caregivers interact, uh, establish mutuality, and create meaning through a shared musical narrative. Uh, she goes on to say, the author suggests that infants teach us to cooperate and collaborate in the construction of these musical narratives through rewarding us with smiles and giggles and kicks and coos, right? So when my daughters were born, one of them happens to be here. Brianna, where are you? There you go. And then Elise, my other daughter, is watching uh, on YouTube right now. She lives in Colorado. When they were born, I, I used to make up songs for them, ding-dong songs all the time. So one of my favorite songs uh, that, I, that I wrote, one of my, favorite, my own favorite songs, goes, cutie patootie, cutie patootie, you are too cute, uh, you are too cute, uh, cutie patootie, cutie patootie, you are too cute, uh, you are too cute. And my daughter would go, ah, 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 again, cutie patootie, cutie patootie. Not so cool at 3 a.m., but cool to do, you know, when, when we're wide awake and everything. And so some might dismiss that as saying, well, you know, if you just did that, that's kind of stimulus response, really, with infants. Right? And that, that's a great behavioral way to think about it, but I think there's more to it. Right? I think that if I came up to your baby and went, cutie patootie, cute, your baby would probably go, ah, you know, not the same reaction. So I, I think there's something to this interaction and this humanness and this collaboration. So the great debate, right? This, if you are uh, into educational psychology, you probably have an understanding of the debate between Piaget and Vygotsky. Uh, Jean Piaget was a Swiss psychologist who lived 1896 to 1980, and he had a theory of child development that we go through stages of development, right? And you've probably heard about this with object permanence and everything. So he had an idea about this, but his theory was that it, uh, we construct our reality through how we interact with our environment in an individual sense, right? Developing our own reality individually. And then later, we start to learn from others. Right, but Lev Vygotsky, who was a Russian social psychologist, and he lived from 1896 to 1934, he had a short life, he believed that right from the get-go, there is this interaction, and, stu and students, people, humans, <laughs> start creating their reality based on their interactions of understanding their culture and watching others and, and their interaction of what, what I just mentioned. So obviously there's validity to both, and the both are giants in our field and how we understand and how we train teachers to develop uh, students and how we understand as parents how our children um, develop. But I, I think uh, what I want to point you to consider is enculturation. Enculturation necessitates collaboration is my premise. Enculturation, if you need the definition, is the process by which an individual learns the traditional content of a culture and assimilates its practices and values. Right, so my daughter with that cutie patootie, maybe if I kept doing a lot of tunes in 7-8 and, and Lydian, that would be something that she's used to. Like people who listen to Greek music and are brought up in that culture are different than people who listen to Britney Spears, right? Or whatever. So I wanna present to you a video, one of my favorite videos of all time. It's this two-year-old and his dad uh, interacting, making some music in their reality, right? And the two-year-old doesn't have a whole lot of words, but he uses all of them. <clears throat> Oops. Nine, 
Daddy and Mommy. And Kian. And Kian. Kian Muffin. Kian's rapping. I love that video. I love that video. That really gets a sense of this enculturation, right? And he's building his reality, and that's, that's what he's living in. So very, very cool. Kazin was rapping at two years old. Nice. Uh, so collaboration and cooperation. I've been throwing around these words a lot in my presentation. I, 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 there's a little bit of a terminology tangle, so I want to uh, clear them up just a little bit. So cooperation, in this case, is working together towards completing a shared goal or task. And that was our, our applause kind of um, opportunity there. Collaboration, though, is bringing various ideas together to forge something new. So what Jordan Janosko had mentioned, um, uh, something greater than the sum of its parts. So you're all bringing your, your strengths to this group and then creating something new. So uh, a study comparing uh, the modes of communication between members of a string quartet and a jazz sextet by Sedin and Biasuti uh, came up with uh, some of these words here. So the distinctions between cooperative and collaborative communication strategies both verbal and nonverbal, were found to rest in the degree to which these strategies facilitated a cohesive performance, which they define as cooperative, or facilitated creative developments in the interpretation of the music. So that's the collaborative part. So in the discussion, they kind of distinguish these things here. So cooperative strategies include players' discussions, focusing on bowings and consistent articulations and vibrato, whereas the collaborative strategies in this qualitative study focused on interpretive decisions, stylistic decisions, uh, is there more? Yes, so cooperative, cohesive performance is the shared goal, whereas the collaborative part is something new is created from their collaboration of ideas, opinions, emotions, right? So this is why you can go, oopsie, this is why you can go hear the same piece performed by different groups and hear a different performance each time, right? They're all cooperating to perform the piece, but the collaboration comes in their unique um, interpretation. So a practical example of this, if you are a classical music fan, you might be familiar with the Orpheus Chamber Ensemble. Here's a little video describing what they do. I wish that the book ran and more, you know, uh, Dignifying. Yeah. Yeah. The Orpheus model is never boring. The idea of Orpheus is that we take symphonic repertoire, play it with chamber music techniques. And what that means is basically that the musicians take over the role of the conductor. Each one of us is as responsible as a conductor for having an interpretation, knowing the score, and being able to discuss those ideas with your colleagues. That's something that's very unusual in an orchestra setting. While it's very exciting, it's also a real challenge to come out with a conclusion and a plan for execution. There needs to be a clear chain of command. You've got to have defined roles. Um, and you really need to create a group consciousness. It starts out with just the core of players who are the principal players for that particular piece, which is different for every piece. Um, and once that gets developed within the chamber music group, the small group, it's then transferred to the large group. And that's one of the most difficult moments, is to take the small group's concepts and see how it's going to work with the bigger group. as a whole may sometimes reject some of their ideas, argue, question, uh, deepen, and so uh, every member on, in, in the rehearsal process and on stage absolutely has a say. I like to tell the story of when I first played with Orpheus, the very first time I was very young and I'm standing in the doorway very shyly because as I say I didn't know anybody and I see people are laughing, they're telling jokes to each other, people are playing licks for each other, playing things on the violin. Just chaos everywhere and I found that absolutely amazing that we can start from from nothing and end up with something that people really want to hear and, and that we all enjoy so much.
Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. People coming together to make music like that. That's great. I've been fortunate enough to study with um, one of the trumpet players from the original group, uh, and he used to tell me stories about them having these conversations all the time. And it's just, I love the humanness of that. Uh, so the, some of the concepts you might have heard in that is shared understanding, shared responsibility, group consciousness, interdependence. And this made me think of this Tanzanian quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's just real powerful. Going together, being together. So you might be familiar with uh, another famous collaboration uh, with Leonard Bernstein and Arthur Lawrence, uh, and Stephen Sondheim. Have you heard of West Side Story? Yeah. Did you know that originally it was called East Side Story? So back in the 40s, when uh, Bernstein and, and the others started to come up with this concept, they wanted it uh, on the East Side, and they wanted the conflict. You know, it's based on the Romeo and Juliet story, right? And so they wanted this conflict between uh, the Jews and the Catholics. And at the time, obviously, in the end of World War II and all things, it was like not a good idea, so they kind of shelved it. Later on in the 50s, they got back together and said, I really think we've got something here, but let's change it to mirror what's happening in contemporary society. And so in the inner city on the west side at that time, there was uh, strife between uh, the whites and the Hispanics or the Latinos. And so let's base it on this and this Romeo and Juliet story. And so I just thought that was really interesting how they kind of changed their, their thing, but they did it in a group kind of way. And so I found an interview with Stephen Sondheim describing how some of this compromise came about. 60 minutes overtime. Now this was your first Broadway musical. This was my first Broadway musical, yeah. So tell me about the collaboration. How did it work? Leonard Bernstein, <laughs> Arthur Lawrence, and well, Jerome I, Robbins. Well, you know, um, what was that collaboration Arthur like? and I collaborated very closely on where songs should occur and uh, what the rhythm of the numbers should be. I don't mean the musical rhythm. I mean where they're to be placed and what they should accomplish. And then when I worked with Lenny, uh, we, uh, he liked to work together and I liked to work separately. So we compromised and I'd say about every three days we would get together, otherwise we would collaborate on the phone. There was only one time when the music came first, in other words, the whole tune was written, uh, which was G. Officer Krupke, because he'd written that tune for another show, for Candide, with another lyric, not by me. And uh, so that was all, all set. So I had to fit lyrics to that tune. And the other one was I wrote a lyric myself. Uh, I, I wrote a lyric uh, before the music was written, which is a song called A Boy Like That. And um, otherwise, we wrote together in the sense of collaborating on the phone and in person. I was always interested in how that worked with a, with a lyricist. And so you would at well, least- Well, let's say I would, I would have a lyric idea and I would bring it in when we got together, and it might spark him into a musical idea, and vice versa. I would come to see him and he would play a musical idea, not an entire piece, mm -hmm. maybe just a couple of phrases, knowing exactly what the situation in the show was gonna be. So he wasn't just writing a tune, he was writing music for that particular moment in the show that he thought would express what the moment was about. And the same thing is true of the lyric, uh, uh, you know. I, talk to Arthur and we'd talk about exactly what the number should be about. And then I would get some uh, lyric phrases and either discuss them with Arthur or just uh, 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 go to Lenny and see him and say, okay, here's an idea, and, or over the phone. So he would have time to think about it. So by the time we got together, he might have a musical idea to go with the lyric idea. These ideas kind of grow from their, their amazingness that they bring to the table, right? So the memorable, memorable word is compromise in his thing, but collaborating and, and creating new music and new sounds. So I'm a big fan of uh, Hans Zimmer, who wrote the music for many movies that you've seen before. One that's out now is Dune 2. And so uh, this is a little bit of an extended video, but it's so important because it, it describes some of the ways that he made these new sounds. Some of the sounds that you've heard in, in Dune, if you've seen that movie or some Inception or whatever, are just like brand new sounds never made before. So let's see what Hans Zimmer has to say. I'm Hans Zimmer, and this is how we created the score for Dune. I, I had, of course, completely transformed his voice into something that was more like a cannonball hitting you in the head. And I played it to Denis more as an experiment, and Denis' reaction was, oh, 
could be an interesting way to start the movie. By putting that voice there as opposed to hearing the beautiful fanfare of a European orchestra, you instantly knew we were going to tell you a story that was dark and mysterious and different, and you couldn't quite work out was this human or was it beyond humanity. You want to invite your audience on an adventure. You want to invite them on a journey. And you have to do it right at the beginning. You have to say it's not going to be quite what you imagined. It's going to be different. It's going to be interesting. And I did that on Lion King with my friend Levo, where suddenly in a Disney movie over black, you hear this, this, this amazing chant from Africa. <laughs> And you instantly know it's not going to be princesses in the conventional sense. The yeah. This, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, is the heroic Loire Kotler. When you are asked to do something that is not in the traditional uh, parameter of what you would think the voice could do, and then you say yes, to, and you say yes to doing something that, in your words, is reckless. <laughs> yes. Amazing things start to happen. But Loire's history is that she does a particular type of singing which is highly unusual. Can you do a bit of, of the oh, sure. rhythmic stuff? We were talking about that Dune has its own rhythm. So it's obvious that I would find a woman who should know everything about rhythm and then give you the cry of a banshee. There's a strength, there's a force that hits you, even without, you know, reverb and compressors and all sorts of stuff. And that was in her voice. And I, I kept saying to Pedro, you start my flautist, don't play it like a flute. Play it as if it was the wind whistling through the desert dunes. You asked me how the score was made, and I said, we were all colleagues, and we did it all together, and that's how it works. The only thing I guarantee you is I will speak the truth. This is the duduk, and this is a very, very ancient instrument. And that's a phrase from Gladiator, actually, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we knew we could do that, but then I said to him, I don't want you to play flutes. Can you make the sound of wind rushing through? Yeah. yeah but, well, plus, a lot of things were built. There were many journeys to the hardware store. I PVC made... is your friend. PVC piping. I actually made a subcontra bass duduk by putting this into a very long tube of PVC. And I literally, I cut the thing to get the different tones. So it is an instrument that doesn't exist anywhere. I do things that not many people in the world can do. But then I told him, yes, yeah, I can do this. He said, can you do air? So yeah, I can do. But can you make vowels while you're doing the air in a flute? And go like, no, don't do this to me. And he's. We did that from a piccolo bansuri to this big fat mama, which is back there, which is a contrabass flute. And I remember one time I sent him 89 tracks of just duduks. Because nobody's ever done it. You're used to seeing 32 violins, you know, 14 celli, six basses, your normal Beethoven type orchestra. But imagine you did it all out of 
those instruments, what would that sound like? Amazing. Perspective to how some of these things are made, right? How people get together to create all of this new entertainment for us. So how does this collaborative compositional effort work? Well, I have some practical information for you. You heard a bit about it from um, one of the other videos, but I got to interview Dr. Bryony, who performed for you earlier. And this is what he had to say about working with composers as a performer and a conductor. So how did it feel to be collaborating with your colleagues and, and creating this piece? And how was the, how was the um, atmosphere and rehearsals and, and the preparation? Well, the one thing I do <laughs> remember was that the uh, recording session at the radio station went um, seven hours. And we, you know, we took some breaks in there, but it just went on and on forever. And the acoustical situation in the room was not ideal. And I thought, oh, we're not going to get anything out of this seven hours. Uh, but it, it went into production and it came back and I was kind of, I was thrilled with the, the final product. Uh, but that was a grind, and you know how you wonder if you're going to be able to get through something. That <laughs> I think it was the inspiration of trying to do it that made everybody dig deep and, and pull it out. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's never easy. I I used to conduct a group in in Evanston, a brass group, and we hired somebody to write a piece. Uh, and uh, he said, are there any limitations? And we said, none whatsoever. And he produced this piece that was so unbelievably difficult uh, that we weren't sure we were going to be able to do it. Uh, but we did, and, but it was quite a challenge, really, to, to kind of put it together. Uh, so if you're writing for a particular individual or professional group or something, you, know, you can really um, go long, I think, on the expectations in the music. Um, but other times, you know, there's maybe a compromise. And sometimes composers get information at the, at the beginning, like what are some of the ranges of your personnel? Uh, and uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? You know, are there certain spots to avoid? And, uh, and they come up with, uh, you know, a, an excellent piece of music. Yeah, so coming together, uh, so you wonder if you're going to be able to get through it. I think it was the inspiration of trying to do it. The shared goal made everybody dig deep and pull it out. They were dedicated to that shared goal and they were in it, right? They had this interdependence. So one of the, another thing I want to show you is an interview with Dr. Mike Fanzler, who's the director of bands here. And he uh, has been working with composers David Maslaka and his son Matthew Maslaka. And we had a special moment here between, um, uh, well, the Maslakas, David had passed away. Um, well, I, I don't want to give away the video here. It's just very touching. When I first had composers out, I was just interested in how they constructed the lines and how they thought our band sounded and things like that. But that all changed in 2011 when I met composer David Maslanka. He visited us and helped us through his fourth symphony and in this next clip, you're gonna see him try to explain to us that we needed to be at a higher level than we currently were thinking. And uh, in this moment of composition, he's explaining to the band about how uh, he had an epiphany about the doxology and how he embedded it into this piece simultaneously at three different speeds. Take a look. You know, when I first knew that this was gonna happen in the music, I could feel it. It was almost a premonition of, of, of starting this and saying, oh, 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 it's going to, and I could not contain it. It just had to come up like that, you know, and it had to be full banging power, and I had to live in that sound without getting killed by it, all right? And that's what I'm asking you to do is to produce that quality of sound that people are in danger of dying from hearing this. <laughs> okay? Try that, all right? That's okay.
doesn't sound good for you. <laughs> and I'm going to change my underwear after this. <laughs> <laughs> the time I spent with David, the time that he worked with our students, literally changed our lives forever. He was an important person for that reason. And when he passed away in 2017, uh, it was amidst a 10th symphony he was writing, for which we part, partly commissioned. And when he passed away, his son Matthew took over the reins and tried to complete that symphony at a time when he was mourning his father's death. We invited Matthew to our stage and he worked with us and together we grieved over the passing of his father. And that was a very emotional and again, inspirational time for our students and everyone involved. Yeah, so you can see, so you can see that I, I work with some pretty amazing colleagues, right? I, I love teaching at the School of Music. It's a great place to be. Collaboration and creativity for healing. So, and now for something completely different. So uh, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about uh, some really positive collaborations and some wonderful opportunities that have occurred, but let's explore co oh, collaborations leading to scandal. Dun, 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 right? <laughs> So if you are a visual art fan, you might recognize this painting. I'm going to, hopefully I don't butcher the French, but Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, is that pretty decent? Uh, by Pablo Picasso. And I included George Braque. He didn't paint this, but uh, he and Picasso came together and created cubism, right? So seeing an image with all of the perspectives all at the same time, all layered on top of each other. Uh, so Stravinsky and Diaghilev, if you're familiar with those names, you might already know where I'm going, but they had a shared goal to shake things up in Paris. So uh, Sergei Diaghilev came to Paris in the early 1900s, and he, his idea was to capitalize upon the fact that Parisians loved Russian history and exoticism and culture and all of these funky things. So he's like, oh yeah, I, I, can, I can do something here. So he created a, a ballet company called the Ballet Russe. And so uh, his idea was to just I expose a wonderful culture to the Parisians in this way with his dance company. And so he, he wanted to write some, or he wanted to produce some ballets, and so he, he's like, I need a really interesting uh, composer. Hey, how about this new guy, Igor Stravinsky? He seems like somebody who uh, might know a thing or two about composing. And so he and Stravinsky got together, and then they, they produced some wonderful ballets, Firebird and Petrushka, and then, and then came the Rite of Spring. So the Rite of Spring, uh, in 1913, so um, they wanted to create a ballet that was about springtime. Wonderful, the Rite of Spring. And so imagine it's 1913, you're going to the premiere of this wonderful new ballet by Diaghilev, and, and Lijinsky was the wonderful dancer at the time and choreographer, and oh, I'm gonna wear my best, and we're gonna go, and we're gonna go see it and be seen at this beautiful event that's gonna celebrate spring. Think about spring, flowers and, and trees and birds and bees doing what they do, and this is gonna be beautiful. I can't wait to see. So everyone sits down like you are, and then it starts with some bassoon lick that is extremely high in the upper register that people have never heard before. And then you start to hear all these instruments playing together in this cacophony, which is supposed to be uh, flowers popping up in spring. And it's just very different than what you might expect. And then finally, finally, we have the sacrifice. Yes, the sacrifice on the stage. People were not happy. <laughs> people were not happy at all. Oh, my God, oh, it's German. Uh, I don't know how to say it in French, but uh, they were just, they freaked out, basically. There was a riot. This is like uh, known in classical music as the most scandalous time. There's a riot. The audience got up and walked out and threw things, and they were just so very, very upset. And so one reviewer wrote, the pagans on stage made pagans of the audience. Crazy times, right? So this got me thinking about this presentation and collaboration, and how can we be scandalous here? Oh, actually, I'm uh, sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, Stravinsky and Diaghilev, um, hold on to that thought, by the way. It's coming. Uh, so Vaslav Nijinsky wrote in his diaries about uh, Stravinsky and Diaghilev, uh, Diaghilev cannot live without Stravinsky, and Stravinsky cannot live without Diaghilev. They understand each other. They are like two torrents of water flowing downhill, each with its own expressive vigor, but both 
capable of coming together in a common confluence. A, a revolutionary spirit uncompromising in the stylistic designs of the work and ideologically enthusiastic in his own creed. So here's a video of uh, Stravinsky first introducing a chord that he wrote for this piece and then how he played it 39 times for Diaghilev. When I finished composing the Rite of Spring, I played it for Diaghilev. And I started to play him this chord, 59 times the same chord. Diaghilev was a little bit surprised. He didn't want to offend me. He asked me only one thing, which was very offending. He asked me, will it last a very long time this way? And I said, till the end, my dear. And he was silent, because he understood that the answer was serious. <laughs> yes, the relationship. So now, now it's time for some uh, scandal on the Kofak stage. So something that has never been done before, as far as I know. Uh, I hope you enjoy the next performance of Trombone Suicide. Hopefully my friends are ready. Yes, here they come. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Do it again, but faster. No, no. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. <laughs> they can actually play the instruments too, but that wasn't part of the act. So. <laughs> So that has never happened on the Kofax stage, as far as I know. Uh, and Dr. Brown, I'm sorry, those were school instruments, some of them, but we were OK. Uh, spontaneous collaboration. Oh, so many times when people think about uh, collaboration in music, they think jazz, right? What happens in jazz when you get a bunch of people together? They all know the tune. They all know the chords. They all know the music. They all know the style. They all maybe all know each other. And so here's what can happen. Here's what it might sound like when they spontaneously create music. This is Happy Birthday.
love that. They, they didn't rehearse that at all. That was a, a birthday for the pianist, Marcus Roberts, and they, I guess they planned it, right? And then they all just did it. They all have an understanding of the style. You heard them starting to imitate each other, uh, and that's, they were just really coming together in that shared understanding. So we're at the end, believe it or not. I know you want to do more activities. I could have you sing and do stuff like that, but we'll save that for the next time, right? So a fitting end to our exploration of collaboration and creativity in music is the Western alma mater. So if you notice, in the first sentence of the Western alma mater, Western students come together. There are the singers. Thank you my, to my collaborators, the brass ensemble, the trombone performers, the singers, the interviewers, and you. Go Western. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kangro. Uh, it was a very enlightening and extraordinary lecture. And on behalf of Western Illinois University, I'd like to present you now with a medal and a plaque uh, commemorating uh, this special occasion and, and to honor you uh, for all of your work. Make sure you wear the medallion, uh, which signifies special distinction at various university events in the future. And here you go, the plaque. Thank you so much. Where is the medal? There it is. Yeah, be, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank well done. You. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kanger, on, on behalf of the president's office, present Dr. Huang, and future myself, <laughs> congratulations on this award. This is a great tradition. This was a wonderful and engaging performance this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good night. Uh, everyone have a wonderful evening again. Um, thank you for, uh, to Dr. Uh, Kangro for an excellent performance. Uh, please, everyone, drive safe and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.